thought I would start out by sharing an encouraging story of how I came to First Baptist and what God has been doing here at First Baptist to encourage you and your local church. Uh, so First Baptist Church of Coco, um, we came there in a very unconventional way. They didn't have a search committee that was searching for a pastor when Kate and I just showed up on our tandem bicycle and rode our bike to church. Praise God. Uh, God, God worked to bring us there uh, ahead of time. After I graduated from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Second best seminary in the world. The number one seminary in the world. Uh, the, uh, while I was there, uh, actually right after, I was teaching English as a second language to Chinese children over the internet. And so that allowed me to really focus on my wife's health. And then also moving from Massachusetts, that's where I met my wife, down to North Carolina, I realized an improvement in my wife's health. And so I thought, what if I take her all the way down to Florida, we can live anywhere with my job right now. And so the Lord brought us down here that way. And I can tell you that if you put your wife first, Ooh. You will be blessed. Yes, sir. Amen. And God had in store for us, um, for me to be pastor of First Baptist Church of Coco, and we had no idea. So um, we just joined the church. Now, the first thing that we were doing was we went to, we were tre checking out churches, like, just like you did whenever you might have moved to this area. Uh, we were checking out churches. We went online to First Baptist Merritt Island because we were, uh, that, that time it was during COVID. Uh, we went over to First Baptist Cape Canaveral. Uh, we, we were trying out some, uh, just, you know, trying to get in the lay of the land. And then my wife, Kate, said, we can ride our bike to First Baptist Church of Coco. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, Kate, I looked on their website. They're, they're liberal. They're duly aligned between the Southern Baptist Convention and also the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And so uh, for a little history lesson here, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, chose in the 90s when all of their professors started to, um, actually in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, their professors started to teach theological liberalism. This is not political li liberalism, this is theological liberalism, as in, you can't trust what this word says. Ooh. Oh. That was being taught in Southern Baptist seminaries, even at, at Southern, at Southeastern, even in the greatest seminaries in the world, that was what was being taught up until around the 90s. But then in the 90s, the average Southern Baptist in the pew realized what was going on. And so they started sending uh, representatives to the Southern Baptist Convention, and that's how we came up with the Baptist Faith and Message, to uh, what later, the later version is the two, Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Mm -hmm. And so now, when you send your kids or grandkids to Southeastern or Southern Seminary, you know that it's going to be taught with sound doctrine according to the Baptist faith and message because the professors can't just teach whatever they want. They have to teach in accordance with this document, which greatly summarize, uh, which summarizes the major doctrines of, of the Word of God that are clearly taught. And so uh, that's, that's a little bit uh, of history, but Southern Baptists did that. Cooperative Baptist Fellowship went the other direction. And so they were saying that, uh, no, they, you know, we, do, we don't really have to trust the Bible on everything that it says. You know, culture has changed. Things have changed. Truth changes. And so uh, I told my wife, Kate, I said, this church is, is, is a little too liberal for us. They, they're, they're part of the Southern Baptist Convention and the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. But then finally she convinced me. She said, please. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so cute if we rode through Coco Village on our tandem bike and we could go to this historic church that started in 1910. And so we, um, I, I finally gave in, and, but the Lord had, had a plan. And so we, uh, we came there and it was mostly older um, folks. I love old, older folks, but there weren't any younger folks. And if we want to have uh, a healthy family, you want to have people of all generations in your church. Exactly. And so uh, we had about 40 to 60 on a Sunday at, towards the end of COVID there. And with our church being, uh, we have a huge sanctuary. We have a, a big uh, gymnasium and fellowship hall and buildings of classrooms that had all been built up during the 60s and the 70s. Well, when, it, when you start having 40 or 50 people in a sanctuary that seats over 700 people, mm. it starts to feel pretty empty. Mm, yeah. And it starts to feel kind of hopeless, to be honest with you. 
Uh, but we, the, the congregation was so friendly, and we just felt like we were supposed to be there. We, we felt at home there right away. Amen. And so we joined as members. I started singing in the choir, playing a little bit. I, I played the guitar like Pastor Lucas. And uh, so I was playing the guitar along with the piano and the organ for the, for the hymns and, and worship songs that we would sing. Uh, and then that summer, the church asked, uh, realized that we had homeschool uh, co-ops that were meeting in our church. And so these are, I was homeschooled myself. That's actually where I met my wife, Kate. And so we're big supporters of homeschooling that uh, you definitely want to support those families that are taking time to, uh, and, and money, and investing in their children personally and making sure that they know what their children are being taught. Uh, so we definitely support that. But uh, we had several homeschool co-ops that were meeting in our church. We had all these teenagers in the church building during the week. Amen. So the, the church, by faith, decided to hire me as a part-time youth pastor to start a youth ministry when we had zero youth. And I remember uh, one of our snowbirds came back and he, uh, from, uh, from, from up north and he, and he, and he said, what? And he, I don't know if he realized that he was talking to the, the youth pastor, but he said, uh, why do we hire a new youth pastor? We don't have any youth. <laughs> well, what comes first? <laughs> the chicken or the egg? Mm. And so uh, by faith, it wasn't in our church budget, but we decided we're going to start a youth ministry. And we're going to hire a part-time youth pastor to, to start this ministry. And so I was hired part-time to start this youth ministry. And we started over the summer with some basketball nights with a short little devotional. And then as soon as the, the fall uh, semester school got started, we, uh, we, we called it youth group. We played other games and we extended the, uh, we, we spent a lot more time in the Bible. And so uh, that's kind of how we got our, our youth ministry started up. And so then we started getting uh, youth, and then uh, our administrator was inspired by the fact that we just went out on a limb, started a ministry, and God blessed it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she started an Awana ministry at the same time. So now there's something for the younger children to do on a Thursday night. And uh, now instead of 40 to 60 people on a Sunday, we have about 150 people on a Sunday. And so that is all because of God. You know, I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians right now, and you definitely want to go to a church that's preaching verse by verse through Scripture, because then God is determining what is being taught, and even the order of what in which it's being taught. And one of the principles that we learned from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is that Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the growth. And so I tell you that story not to say that uh, oh, look, if you get the right pastor, this is all, this is what's going to happen. It's if you stand on the word of God and you plant and you water and you have faith that something's going to come up. And if you're persistent and patient, this didn't happen overnight. Then God, you'll, you'll see God do amazing things. And so that, that's a little bit of what's going on at First Baptist Coco. Now, how I became senior pastor was an interesting story, too. I applied, I felt called to be a senior pastor, to be a preaching pastor, and yet, it seems like every church is looking for five to ten years minimum of senior pastor experience. Well, if every church is looking for that, how do you get that? <laughs> and so I, I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to try, uh, I'd like to spend some more time in study. I'm going to apply to the Doctorate of Ministry program at Southern Seminary. And so I'm about to, I'm good, Lord willing, I'll graduate from, with, with my D-Min, Doctorate of Ministry, in December. But I did that in, uh, in Christian apologetics, and I thought that that would help prepare me to be a senior pastor. Well, I didn't know that God was going to put me on a fast track. Because then our senior pastor I was serving under took me out to my, me and my wife out to dinner and said, oh, we're going to another position, and I'm going to recommend you to be the interim pastor. And so I spent six months on, on, on interview. You know, six-month interview. And a lot of times they say that the uh, interim has an advantage. I don't know about that. You know, you, you've been on the hot seat for 30 minutes. That's one thing in an interview. But you're on the hot seat every time somebody interacts with you because they're all evaluating. And, but uh, eventually uh, they called me to be a uh, senior pastor there. I've been there for almost two years. And so uh, that's a little bit of how I became that. But through that, I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to be a youth pastor. I'm going to get this doctorate of ministry. Maybe in five or ten years I'll be a senior pastor. But God had other plans. 
Uh, so it's very difficult to balance studies with ministry, uh, but it's also very rewarding. And one of the reasons I wanted to study Christian apologetics, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, is because I wanted to be able to give a defense or a reason for the hope that I have. And if you're familiar with 1 Peter 3.15, that's what I just quoted. Mm -hmm. We need to be ready to give a defense when someone asks us for a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. And I didn't just want to have to say, well, tell you what, I'll get back to you on that after I've studied for a week. I wanted to be prepared to answer that person's objection when they have it. Amen. And now I still have to, certain, certain objections that people have that I've never heard of before, I might say, let me get back to you on that. Uh, but now that I have this set aside the study, I'm able to answer people on the spot for, the, for some of the more common objections. So the objection uh, that I'm going to be talking with you all uh, today about is the reliability of Scripture. So let's say uh, you, there's a truth from Scripture. You're trying to tell your friend or your family member that this is, this is what's true. This is what the Bible says. Now, if someone says, but I don't believe the Bible, I don't think it's true. Does that end the conversation for you? No, sir. We need to be able to also not only be able to say, this is what the Bible says, but also be able to say, and this is why I believe the Bible. Because if we can explain the reliability of Scripture to people and get them in the Word of God, the Word of God is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's living and it's active and it's capable of, of cutting down to their soul. But we've got to get people in there. And God can use us as His instruments to help them understand the truth of God's Word. And so uh, one of uh, this is... This presentation is a little bit of what I studied in uh, my most recent class, which was the canon and the resurrection. And so, specifically, we're talking about the canon of Scripture, which is uh, basically the, the books of accepted Scripture. And specifically, we're going to narrow it down to just four. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are referred to as the Gospels. So you have little g, Gospel, and so when... Uh, when Pastor Lucas introduced me and said I was going to preach the gospel, that's that little G. That's that story of what Jesus did for us. It's that grand narrative of everything that happens in Scripture and how we can be how we can be saved. So we share the gospel with people. That's little G. We don't have to capitalize that one. But then the big G gospels are the names of the books: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospels. That's the that's a big G because it's referring to names of books. And so uh, to start out, I'd like to ask a couple questions just to see where you guys are in, uh, in this. Uh, my first question, and I want a raise of hands for this, who here believes that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are formally anonymous? And so what this means is the author does not give us his name in the book. Who here believes that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, anonym are formally anonymous? They don't give us their names in the book itself. Okay, we've got one. Who, who here does not believe that? Raise your hand. Oh, we got some people who aren't voting over here. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question I have for you is that, uh, so the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, do you agree with the statement that all the all four gospels were written by eyewitnesses. Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. All four gospels were written by eyewitnesses. Okay, raise your hand if you don't think all four gospels were written by eyewitnesses. We got one over here. Wow, we we got a lot of split here. Okay, we're gonna clear both of these things up, um, and we're gonna make this very clear. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's right. I raised my hand and I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. What about Luke? <laughs> oh, I'm trying to trick Pastor Lucas over here. Uh, okay, so one of the things that we're responding to is a professor named Bart Ehrman. Anybody ever heard of Bart Ehrman? This is not part of the quiz, but uh, this is Bart Ehrman. He was a prof yeah, he is a professor at UNC um, at Chapel Hill, and that's actually uh, how I got my name in uh, the year I was born. Uh, the, the Tar Heels were in the uh, NCAA tournament, and my dad said, if they win, we'll name them Dean. 
Dean Smith, that's how I got my name. Uh, but Bart Ehrman is teaching, so if you take a religion class, a New Testament class at UNC, you will be taught that because the, the Gospels, uh, you will be taught, first of all, that none of the Gospels were, were based on eyewitness testimony. That over time, these stories were collected and changed and then finally written down. And so then you will be taught, your, if you send your kid to UNC or even a lot of schools, uh, you know, secular schools around here, and they take a religion class or a New Testament class, they're going to be taught that the New Testament is not reliable. And so here, here are some of the reasons. Now, Bart Ehrman, in his book, Jesus Before the Gospels, a lot of the things that he says are technically true or correct, but they're misleading. And so we need to make sure that our kids, our grandkids, when they go to university and they, they, they take a religion class, they take a New Testament class, that they are going to be able to see through these kinds of arguments. Because you will be able to see, I'm going to explain to you how these are, are faulty. Is this CNN? Uh, this, would be, <laughs> this would be a, a, lot, a lot of things. So, are, CNN, you know, say, yeah. say. so uh, first of all, uh, Bart Ehrman will make a big deal about the fact that the earliest copies of the Gospels did not have titles. So earlier I asked you, uh, who here believes that the Gospels are formally anonymous? Formally anonymous means they don't say who wrote them in the text itself. And so uh, Bart Ehrman will say, okay, the, uh, the Gospels do not have... If you take a moment and you have your Bible with you, and you look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... The only way that we know that they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is because of the titles. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in those books does it say, I, John, wrote this book, or I, Mark, wrote this book. So we learn that information from the titles. Now what Bart Ehrman will tell you is that the earliest copies of the Gospels didn't have titles. So now you're thinking, okay, well, I thought, uh, I'm getting really confused here. Put yourself as a student at UNC in this religion class. You growing up in church? Your pastor's never told you this. And you thought, when, when Bart Ehrman said, raise your hand if you think that the Gospels are, are uh, formally anonymous, you didn't raise your hand because you're like, no, they're not formally anonymous. I know who wrote them. And yes, you do know who wrote them, but you don't have those names within the book itself. And so what... Bar Ehrman will do is, is, uh, is tell you that the earliest copies of the Gospels did not have titles. Both these things are true. The earliest copies that we have, that we have, do not have titles. So how do we know who really wrote these books? Think about that. Now, what Bar Ehrman does not tell you is that the earliest copies of the Gospels did not survive intact enough to be able to see what the title was. The earliest copy of the gospel that we probably have is, um, they name these little fragments. So the earliest copies we have are just fragments. Every copy of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we have that survived intact enough to be able to see the title, they were written at the top of the page, at the bottom of the page, at the beginning or at the end, Every single one that survived enough for us to be able to read that has a title. And they all have those four titles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what uh, Bart Ehrman is not telling you is that the earliest copy is the size of a business card. Of course it doesn't have a title. But what he's not telling you is that every copy of the Gospels that survived, long, uh, survived intact enough we can see who, the, who wrote it, where, where it is in the title. So now, are you starting to see how confusing this could be for a young college student if you only pre present some of the evidence and then you draw these kinds of conclusions? Uh, then, uh, I think the, the most hilarious thing about Bart Ehrman's claim that, these, that the Gospels are formerly anonymous and making a big deal about this is that I went into Bart Ehrman's book uh, Jesus before the gospel. We had to read a book we disagreed with, and then all the other books in the seminary course were books that we did agree with. 
But this book that, uh, Bart Ehrman's book, nowhere in his own book did he say, I, Bart Ehrman, have written this book. <laughs> Where do you get that information? From the title page. We know who wrote Jesus before the Gospels. It was Bart Ehrman because we look at the title page and we get the author's name. And it's the same thing with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you can be confident that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So now we're going to get to that other question I asked you about all four Gospels being written by eyewitnesses. Now the truth is that two of our Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. And this is why it's important that when you're training your children, your grandchildren, in these kinds of things, and they're going to be exposed to these kinds of objections, that you know what's fact and what's fiction. Because if someone tells them, uh, you know, if, if, if they were to respond, oh yeah, all four Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. That's what my pastor told me. That's what my dad told me. That's what a deacon told me. But then they come to find out that only two of them were. Your confidence in those, the, those authorities might be shaken a little bit. So it's really important for us to be able to explain these kinds of things to our children, to our grandchildren, so that they know the truth. But uh, Matthew and John were both eyewitnesses. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, another objection that Bart Ehrman gives is that, uh, you know, the, the disciples were fishermen, right? Fishermen in that day didn't know how to write. Hardly anybody knew how to read and write in that day. And so how do we have these Gospels that were supposedly written by eyewitnesses when all the eyewitnesses were just fishermen? who couldn't even write. Now, uh, Matthew, we know, was a tax collector. So he would have had to have had a at least a little bit of writing training in order to take these records. And then we look at John. I, I want you all to think with me a little bit. If you didn't know how to write, and you wanted to write a book, how could that happen? You could hire someone to write it for you. You could dictate it. And that's what we believe that uh, John did. And this was a common practice. And so you can be confident that these, this is John's book because he would dictate it, the scribe would write it down, and then the scribe would read it back to the author, and then the author would say, yep, that's what happened. And so we have eyewitness testimony from that, both Matthew and John. Also, Mark and Luke, although they weren't eyewitnesses themselves, they were closely associated with eyewitnesses who gave eyewitness testimony. So uh, the, we know about Luke because Luke wrote another book in the New Testament. What's that? Acts. Acts. And in Acts, we see the we passages. When Luke, the writer of Acts, is with the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul probably wasn't an eyewitness, eyewitness to the earthly, the earthly ministry of Jesus, but uh, Luke was in a lot of places where he, he could have interviewed eyewitnesses if you, if you look through the book of Acts. And then uh, also in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, this is how the book of Luke starts out. And as much as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, and servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. And so Luke tells us his research method. He says, I interviewed eyewitnesses. This is based on eyewitness testimony. And we can be confident that what is written in the Gospels really happened. You can be confident of that. And then when it comes to the book of Mark, we learn from church history that Mark was a close associate of the apostle Peter. And so you might wonder, where, uh, you know, Peter was an important member of the church, an important leader in the church, in the, among the disciples. And yet he didn't write a gospel. Well, he didn't write one, but Mark wrote one based on Peter's preaching and, and sharing those stories of Jesus. And so 
It's true. Only two of our Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, but all four of them were written based on eyewitness testimony. So make sure that we get that right as we're instructing our, uh, our, our, our young ones. Uh, another one uh, that I'd like to, to bring up is that let's just take a moment to think. Okay, Bart Ehrman, let's, let's assume that what he's saying is true. That the, the four Gospels, they didn't have titles to begin with. And so they're circulating among the churches without titles for many years. And then finally someone adds titles. What, kind, what would we expect to find with this? Uh, first of all, the church didn't have a, a central authority. A, a, sorry, our Catholic friends. It didn't have a real central authority at the, in the early church. And so you would expect, if these Gospels didn't have titles, that nobody knew who wrote them, that in Rome, they'd be given one name. And then in Egypt, they'd be given another name. And in Jerusalem, they'd come up, oh, maybe this person wrote it. But what we have with every single manuscript is every, every, every piece of manuscript that's part of Matthew is attributed to Matthew. Every piece of manuscript that is part of Luke is attributed to Luke. And so you can be confident that the Gospels had titles from the beginning and are connected to eyewitness testimony. Uh, here's another practical problem. Let's say uh, Pastor Lucas wants to uh, do a reading of the, of the gospel. And let's say we're in an early church. And they had maybe uh, scrolls or code, uh, codices. And these are early forms of books. Maybe we only have two gospels. If Pastor Lucas says to one of his deacons, Hey, deacon so-and-so, I want you to read from... Which gospel? How are you going to... You have to have a name to be able to distinguish between the maybe two, three, four Gospels that you had as a church. You couldn't just say, oh no, the other one. You know, Gospel A, Gospel B. No, they all have those names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you could be confident um, that these are the, uh, the names. And so I'd like to close with, uh, I think one of the most powerful, uh, powerful things that Bart Ehrman does against what we believe is he will use a faulty analogy. And so he will use a game that we play in Sunday school sometimes. You ever played the telephone game? Where uh, one person, you, you come up with a message, you tell it to one person, and then uh, we whisper it in that person's ear, that person's ear, that person's ear. And by the time we get around, it's hilarious how much the message has changed. And so what Bart Ehrman will say is, that's a, you know that game you played in Sunday school? That's exactly what, how the Gospels got handed down to us. Somebody told somebody, told somebody, told somebody, told somebody, and the messages got changed. That's how that supernatural stuff got added in there. And so what we need to explain is that if it's based on eyewitness testimony, then the person who said it to begin with is there when we get to the very end of the telephone game and can say, no, that's not what I said. Because the Gospels were written during the lifetime of the authors and the, the eyewitnesses to what happened, then they were there to correct if there was something that got changed along the way. They were still alive when these Gospels were written. Even if you take... They, a lot of times, the, these critical scholars will take a very late date for the Gospels. Even if you say, okay, sure, late date, there were still eyewitnesses alive during that time. And so you can be confident in our Gospels that the, this is what really happened when Jesus of Nazareth was walking our earth. And you can also be able to, I pray, that you'll be able to equip those who might be going to university or, or college that when they take a religion class, when they take a New Testament class, that they're not going to get confused and they're not going to get misled by a misrepresentation of the facts because the facts are on our side. Um, mind if I close this in prayer? Okay. Awesome. Dear Father, we thank you so much that we can come together as men and Lord, we believe and we are confident that what we have in your word is the has been the the per perfectly preserved word of God, Lord. We know that your word is, is absolutely perfect. 
And in its original autographs, there are no errors whatsoever. Any errors that are that that we might uh, or discrepancies might, might we might find are because of humans trying to copy it. But Lord, we know that we have your word, and that no doctrine of scripture is affected by discrepancies in copying. And Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen our faith. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen these men's faith, and that you would embolden them to share the rel the reliability of the gospels and what they say with their sons and daughters, with their grandchildren, with uh, their wives, and with the people around them. And Lord, help us to stand on your word and to share the good news of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for having me. Yes, question. Uh, the, you know, uh, we were watching.